Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Towards the beginning of the British involvement in slavery, the Church of England sought ways on how to grow and control the slave trade, while at the same time satisfying themselves that they were doing the honourable thing in saving souls. So they set about to systematically convert black and Native American Indian slaves to Christianity. As we explore some of the religious strategies used, we must first understand that the slaves knew nothing of Christianity. So this was a new endeavour facilitated by the slave trade. The Church of England were instrumental in this endeavour. And in 1711, Reverend William Fleetwood in St. Marylebone, London, at a general meeting of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, delivered a historic sermon on February the 16th, 1711. The whole premise of this historic sermon was that Christianity was to overthrow idolatry, root out the worship of many gods, and to reform the wicked world in all instances, facilitating the control and justification of Negro slaves, encouraging their conversion to Christianity as it was the only way they would be saved and have a less oppressive slavery experience. One of the first verses used in the sermon is Acts 26 verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The slaves were seen as savages, idolaters, infidels, vicious, ignorant, primitive in their knowledge of anything spiritual. The bishop goes on to say, which is one reason why the Christian morality exceeds all others, because the Christian revelation discovers a more excellent and perfect supreme being than any other institution or religion. Verses like 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 was used in the sermon to stoke fear into the slaves, planting the seed of something worse than slavery coming their way if they didn't convert to Christianity. The sermon narrative was that Africans were sinners and must be shown the error of their pagan ways and only through the mighty saviour and deliverer Christ can they be saved. The psychology is clear. The goodness of God is like himself, infinite. He does not only save us from our sins, but crowneth us with mercy and loving kindness. And that slaves were to be innocent and in obedience, and to be forever happy. Only sinning would make them see God's displeasure and punishment, and end up burning in hell. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 was used to offer both consolation and a threat to the slaves. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. As we read the sermon, one of the statements made were, slaves were seen as cast out of God's favour. Thus they were removed and taken away to be reconciled to God, received again into his favour and returned to happiness. They needed to repent for their sins and obey his laws and privilege will be granted to those that convert to Christianity and seek forgiveness. The bishop pleaded with slave masters to permit their slaves to be instructed in the faith of Christ and brought to baptism. Slaves were made to be happy slaves and however hard their condition be in this world, with respect to their capacity and subjugation, they were to be as just and honest and virtuous as godly and religious as their masters. What account then will these masters give of themselves who are the occasion and the instruments of bringing these unhappy people from a country where the name of Christ is never heard or called upon into a country where Christians govern all and Christ is called their Lord and Master and yet will not permit these slaves to be instructed and become the servants of this heavenly master. The bishop said the only inhumane thing that could be done to slaves is not converting them to Christianity 
and preach guidelines for how to approach this. The first is that were their slaves Christians, they would immediately upon their baptism become free. The second is that were their slaves Christians and still continue slaves, yet they should be obliged to treat them with more humanity and mercy than the nature and necessity of their service would admit of to make their masters gainers. And the third is much of the same kind, that were their slaves Christians, they could not sell them, it being unlawful, they say, to sell Christians. Knowing that this would not be well received, he goes on further to say, there is no fear of losing the service and profit of their slaves by letting them become Christians. Their avarice and cruelty are grounded on a certain mistake. They are neither prohibited by the laws of God nor those of the land from keeping Christian slaves. Their slaves are no more at liberty after they are baptised than they were before. There were people in St Paul's time that imagined they were freed from all former engagements by becoming Christians. But St Paul tells them this was not the meaning of Christian liberty. The liberty wherewith Christ had made them free was freedom from their sins, freedom from the fears of death and everlasting misery, and not from any suit of light, in which they had either voluntarily engaged themselves or were fallen into through their misfortune. The bishop used 1 Corinthians 7 verse 20 to prove his point. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. He goes on to say, let every man know that his being called to the faith of Christ does not exempt him from continuing in the same state of life he was in before. It makes no alteration of his condition in this world. The liberty of Christianity is entirely spiritual. Nor do the laws of the land hinder people from being slaves when they become Christians. Christianity has no advantages or privileges now peculiar to it, to distinguish it from any other sect or party. And therefore, whatever liberties the laws indulge to us, they do it to us as Englishmen and not as Christians. If therefore it be lawful in our country to have or keep slaves at all, it is actually lawful to have or keep them so, for they are Christians. Bishop Fleetwood goes on to say, The third and last pretense is built upon that of interest. For since they bought their slaves for money, they would be losers by permitting them to be made Christians, since after that they could not part with them for money, it being, they say, unlawful to sell Christians. The bishop addresses the concerns of slave masters who don't want to convert slaves to Christians because they don't want to sell Christians. The bishop says, if men had truly a propriety in their slaves before they were baptised and could not dispose of them as they do of other goods and cattle for money or its worth, I dare be positive. The laws of Christ will not deprive them of this property and I am very sure the laws of the kingdom take not away the right of such a sale upon receiving baptism if it were justifiable before. The bishop quoted Deuteronomy 25 verse 4, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. In other words, masters shall not starve the slaves while the slave is preparing bread to feed his master. This religious society itself owned 300 slaves across two plantations. Like most religious organisations, the objective of the society was to increase its wealth. So after this very sermon, they requested Her Majesty the Queen to encourage a public collection from all the parishes and precincts. They sought to appoint a bishop to govern the missionaries in New York, New England, Pennsylvania and other parts of North America, Her Majesty's colonies. They taught slave children to read and write and understand Christianity as taught by the Church of England, but the only permissible reading material was the Bible and prayer books and other practical and devotional material, sending English and French prayer books to Carolina and New York. 
The society sought to build relations with native Indian leaders to form an alliance with the Crown of England, teaching English to the native Indians, the Yamasee Indians, in order to instruct them in the knowledge of the Christian religion. We will explore more of these critical historic religious sermons and strategies in future videos. Thank you.